All right. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Cassie Fye. I'm the program director at NAMI Greater Cleveland. Um, part of our uh, programs are offering various psychoeducation, community education opportunities. And uh, this year I have been facilitating monthly uh, webinars that have a specific focus on uh, creative paths towards healing by highlighting various therapeutic expressive art forms. So last month we did drama therapy. We are here for music therapy today, which is super exciting. Um, and next month we will actually have um, an equine therapist joining us from Hope Meadow to talk about equine therapy, which will be great as well. Um, I am going to share a evaluation link at the end in the chat box. It takes about two minutes to click through, and it's really helpful for us to continue to provide um, opportunities like this and also continue to provide um, free programmings and just see if there are other topics that might be of interest for us to explore in the future for um, education and, and outreach opportunities. But I don't want to take up too much time. I want to make sure to turn it over to our speaker. Um, we will have a question period at the end. Uh, you're free to type questions into the chat throughout if you uh, just kind of want to save them and not forget about them. Um, but we will be having space for that um, at the end of the presentation. But going to introduce our presenter, Alicia Bausner. Um, Ruby? Remind me if I'm mispronouncing that last name, Alicia. <laughs> Please correct me. You did it perfectly. It's just like the gem. Love it. Um, so Alicia is a board certified music therapist. Um, she is the founder and um, and executive director of In Harmony Therapeutic uh, Services of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, In Harmony is a not-for-profit private practice. Um, Alicia received a bachelor's degree um, in psychology from the University of Mount Union in 2010, and she received a master's of music degree in vocal performance from Cleveland Institute of Music in 2012. Um, she's obtained her national board certification in music therapy through Baldwin Wallace University in 2017. Alicia specializes in using music therapy with children and adolescents who've experienced trauma and is a certified trauma-sensitive practitioner through Lesley University. In addition to trauma-informed supports, Alicia combines music therapy with individualized behavioral supports, restorative practices, and community building in her practice. She believes in a multi-module, individualized, whole-person approach, um, which is the foundation for a strong therapeutic relationship. Alicia is on faculty of the Cleveland Music Therapy Consortium at Baldwin Wallace University, and she serves as the co-chair of the Ohio Music Therapy Task Force. And I will turn it over to Alicia. Hi, everybody. So, so great to have you all here. Cassie, thank you for that introduction. That's amazing. Um, I'm so glad to be here with all of you in the sunshine. I have some sun streaming in. It's Cassie. Um, um, Sia said that she has some sun, so this is going to be great. Um, let me orient our brains for what we're going to be doing this afternoon, because it's afternoon. Um, we're just a brief introduction, a little bit more about me um, and kind of what I do. And then we're going to go through some questions on what is music therapy, who are music therapists, um, the history of music therapy in the United States, um, how music therapy works who music therapy is practiced with, where music therapy is practiced, and where you can go for more information. And then we'll end with questions. If there's any issues hearing me, understanding me, seeing what's going on on the screen, please let me know. I will, because I know um, I'm not sure where people are coming in from, I will read what is on the screen um, so that that is available to you. But if there's any, any issues, please feel free to let us know. And with that, I think that's all the housekeeping. Let's get started. So as Cassie said, I'm Alicia Basner Ruby. Um, I use she, her pronouns, um, and I am a board certified music therapist, um, soon to be a licensed practical music therapist in the state of Ohio, um, which we are very excited about. Um, so I was able to, I went about music therapy in a little bit of a different way. I don't have a 
degree per se in music therapy, but there is an opportunity for music therapists to obtain board certification through equivalency programs. So if you have a music degree, um, you can then go to an approved music therapy program and take the coursework that you need um, and um, are able to then sit for the national board certification exam. And so that's how I was board certified and um, I was able to obtain the trauma sensitive practitioner um, graduate certificate from Lesley University. And so I've been doing that for um, the last few years. Um, Cassie mentioned in Harmony Therapeutic Services and a little bit more about what we're about. We are a not-for-profit private practice here in the greater Cleveland, Ohio region. Um, we serve primarily Cuyahoga and Lorraine County. Um, our, our, our mission is to provide and advocate for high quality music therapy services for all in need. So we identified it in Harmony that there was um, a funding gap in for individuals to receive services. Um, so uh, music therapy is listed as a uh, related service under the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act. Um, we are not currently a reimbursable service. Um, and so that can make accessing services um, challenging. We're not um, currently able to be reimbursed by insurance and Medicaid. We're working on those things and we're hoping that licensure will improve access um, to services, but there does exist this funding gap. And so as a nonprofit um, in Harmony is able to utilize some creative funding plans, some fundraising um, from, uh, from grassroots donations and also um, grant support to be able to close that funding gap and increase access to services. Um, we primarily work with ch child, adolescent, and adult mental and behavioral health and developmental disabilities. And again, we are in primarily Cuyahoga and Lorraine counties. So that's just a little bit about uh, the organization and what it does. So you're all here to learn about music therapy today. Um, and so let's talk about what that is. This is the definition from the American Music Therapy Association. This is the National Music Therapy Organization. Um, and it defines music therapy as the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed and approved a music therapy program. And I will say the American Music Therapy Association has crammed a lot of words into this definition, but there's a lot of important aspects to this definition and really what makes music therapy music therapy and what differentiates music therapy from other therapeutic music mediums and also music education. So the first thing to know is that there's there is a body of research behind music therapy, that it's clinical and there's evidence for it. So you can um, go to the Journal of Music Therapy, which is, which is the National Music Therapy Journal. Um, there's a couple of other publications and look at peer reviewed journal articles and evidence for the use of music therapy in the clinical setting. So there's a body of research behind um, the profession. There's also Music interventions. <clears throat> so music interventions are specifically designed with music at the center, right? And the elements of music they're in. So things like tempo, how fast or slow music goes, um, pitch, how high or low um, a certain note is. Um, Temp I, th I said tempo, harmony, so if things are major or minor, all of those elements of music, and there's many, many more. Um, and then those are paired with, with some sort of intervention, so movement or songwriting or lyric analysis. Um, and those are specifically chosen to affect change. So there's this idea of music interventions um, that are designed and chosen to accomplish individualized goals. So that's where their change comes in, that therapeutic approach, right? That a client might have individualized goals and objectives that they have chosen 
or that a treatment and assess a treatment assessment and a treatment plan has identified um, that those music and inter interventions are addressing right there's an intention there's a purpose behind what is happening within the session there's a therapeutic relationship right there's there is a connection between the therapist and the client there is a two-way communication there's this fluid dynamic relationship that exists between a music therapist and their client or clients and that therapist is a credentialed professional so there is a national credentialing board for music therapists the credentialing board for music therapists very aptly named um that when we um sit for our board certification exam, they say, yes, you passed, you're a board certified music therapist. So they're, and, and as part of that, they're able to identify whether or not the, that individual, that therapist has completed an approved music therapy program. So there are specific education requirements. There's specific standards of practice. There's specific competencies. So we have to be competent in musical skills in clinical skills, um, in there's research components that all of those competencies, and then there's ethics, right. That, that we are, um, we are called to uphold as a credentialed professional. And all of that is part of our approved music therapy program. And we're able to complete that and then, and then sit for that exam. So we have the body of research, specific intentional music interventions with individualized goals as part of a treatment plan. There's a therapeutic relationship with a credentialed professional. So you see that music therapist board certified. So my credentials are MTBC. And we know that if that person has that credential, that they um, have completed an approved music therapy program and have the prerequisite skills to practice music therapy. Why is that important? Because sometimes people call therapeutic music, music therapy. Um, and so that's kind of a thing where some harm can be caused. And so we just want to be careful, um, you know, about making sure that if, if, if someone is claiming that they're offering music therapy or seeing that they're a music therapist, that they hold that credential. Um, and that allows um, the client to know that they have these prerequisite um, things in place to reduce the risk of potential harm. Okay, so now that we hopefully know what music therapists, uh, music therapy is, let's talk about who are music therapists. And we already talked a little bit about this when we we're talking about the definition. So music therapists have a bachelor's degree or higher in music therapy. So again, they're going to that approved program and they're achieving bachelor's level degree or higher. So there's um, bachelor's in music therapy, master's in music therapy, and there are recently more programs in um, doctoral programs in creative arts therapy, which is um, includes music therapy. Um, in a training program um, with bachelor's degree level, there's court, you know, there's your traditional kind of core coursework that um, a student would have to take. And then they're taking courses they're in psychology. They're taking courses in um, verbal processing. They're taking courses in music. So there's like specific music courses. They're also taking courses in population, music therapy with specific populations, some clinical applications for music therapy. And then there's also practicum courses. So there's field work courses that also have to be taken. This training can also occur at the post-baccalaureate level. So this is the route that the route that I chose to go. Um, and so what I was able to, to do is, you know, my training program took my transcripts from my psychology degree and they took my transcripts from my music degree and they say, okay, what fits in the current coursework? you know, um, this class checks that box, this class checks this box. Okay. What's left. And so for me, what was left was a lot of those core music therapy courses along, um, related to clinical applications, um, psychology and music, and then the practicum courses, the field work, um, component. We have, um, 
we've talked about that approved program by the American Music Therapy Association. There are currently around 80 uh, approved programs in the United States. Um, and as part of that clinical training, we are required to complete 1,200 hours of direct client contact and clinical training. Um, and that includes a supervised internship. So typically um, in our program, we get about 200 hours of clinical training. So this could be direct service with a client. This could be documentation. This could be um, uh, supervision that is obtained by the student. And then there's about a thousand, it's a little bit more than that, but there's about a thousand hours left that is required of the student. And that is typically, and that is, um, typically a six month internship, but we've had people extend longer because the main thing is they get that thousand hours of internship, um, supervised internship experience. And that occurs after they've completed their coursework, um, before they sit for the exam. And technically their degree is not conferred until they've completed that internship. Um, once they have all of that done, then they sit for a board certification exam. It's a very long test. <laughs> it, it's it's really interesting though, because you do kind of all of this clinical work and then um, it's a multiple choice test that you end up sitting for, which is a little wonky, I think. But all that to say, it's a big test and you sit for the exam. And if you pass, you are immediately um, obtain the MTBC, which is music, music Therapist Board Certified credential. And so any music therapist that you see will have that credential after their name. Um, as of July 4th, 2024, House Bill 33 passed the um, Ohio State Legislature. And so there will be an Ohio license for music therapists. So we have been placed under the Counseling, Social Worker, Marriage, and Family Therapist Board. Um, I, as the co-chair of the Ohio Music Therapy Task Force, Cassie mentioned that at the beginning, um, I have been guiding and the counseling board on the rules related to a license in music therapy, um, the scope of practice related to music therapists, and we are hope currently licenses have not been distributed because we have to kind of, you know, do all of this back of house work, this infrastructure work. Um, but we're hoping within the next few months that will be up and running. And then music therapists in the state of Ohio will all be required to apply for license, a license and have a license. So we will also have, you'll see my name will change to after my name, it'll say MM, then it'll say LPMT, licensed practical music therapist, and then it will say MTBC. Um, and that's helpful for a couple of different reasons. Um, it's helpful to increase access of music therapy. So again, if we're looking at Medicaid, Medicare, insurance, um, a lot of a barrier to accessing that funding is the lack of a license in the state of Ohio. So we're hoping that the license will increase our ability, will remove that barrier and increase our ability to access those funding sources. Also, we have seen that, you know, music therapists who work in schools or music therapists that work for specific agencies, they're required to have a license number. Um, and so we're hoping that this improves um, employment opportunities for those individuals, for music therapists to, you know, work in those different agencies. Um, and then there's also title protection that's, in, that's included as part of this legislation that an individual calling themselves a music therapist and saying that they practice music therapy must be licensed in the state of Ohio. And that is now law and statute. So again, reducing that harm for individuals that might, whether knowingly or unknowingly, I'm not assuming ill intent, um, calling themselves a music therapist or what they do music therapy, um, really making sure that they have these prerequisite things that we've just talked about um, before they can do that. All right, so we know what music therapists are. The history of music therapy is short compared to other uh, therapeutic mediums in the United States. So in the early 1900s, there were early forms of music therapy that emerged in the United States. And this is based off of um, 
you know, Plato talked about the therapeutic nature of music, right? There's, there is a therapeutic connection to music that spans millennia and generations, um, years and years and years. Um, and early forms of music therapy really started to emerge in the United States in the early 1900s. Um, after World War II is when things really started to get going. So in the early 1900s, things really didn't go go anywhere. Um, but after World War II, what individuals were seeing was a lot of people coming back from the war with um, a high incidence of trauma, as you would imagine. And so um, music therapy was being used in some therapeutic, as a, as a valid therapeutic modality to help individuals navigate the trauma that they were experiencing post-World War II. And as part of that, a formal music therapy curriculum was established at Michigan State University. So the field really has only been around for about the past 80 years in a formal way. Um, in 1958, so more than a decade later, is when we get the first national music therapy organization. It wasn't the American Music Therapy Association. It was the National Association for Music Therapy. Um, that that uh, national organization went through um, a little bit of a, a change in the 90s. But that first national music therapy organization established in 1958 allowed for some standardization about curriculum, standardization on cred credentialing, the body of research was able to get up and running. So really we're talking about the last, you know, 70, 70, 75 years has really been when music therapy um, has been built. And now in 2024, I think the last um, count was that there was around 10,000 um, board certified music therapists across the country, which is really not that much actually. Um, but considering that we've only been really around for the past 70 years, I think it's pretty good. And there's, again, 80 approved programs um, for clinical training for music therapists. And there's the national organizations, the National American Music Therapy Association, and then the National Credentialing Board. So they function separate and also work really closely together. Um, and so that is where music therapy is in the United States as of now. Okay, but how does it work, right? Like this is great. Um, what's the research? What's that evidence-based clinical um, practice show us? There's a lot of ways that music that music therapy works. And we know, I think inherently, I think anecdotally, all of us probably on this call can say that they have benefited therapeutically um, from music in some way um whether it's you know you're feeling sad and you listen to an upbeat song or you know in our house with my son we do a lot of dance parties when we're feeling some sort of way um and there is the inherent kind of therapeutic nature to music but really like why like how does it work right so one of the first thing first things about music is that it produces dopamine, which is a reward chemical in our brain. So we listen to music and we feel good. It makes us feel good. Um, other food also releases dopamine chemicals in our brain. So it's like a, it's like a happy, like a hug, like a happy, happy um, chemical in our brain. And we feel that when we listen to music. Um, music is dynamic. It's interactive. We often feel a very highly personal connection to music, right? For most of us have, you know, our favorite artists or our favorite genres, and we feel a very just highly personal connection to how we experience music. Um, and as far as the therapy part, it's often seen as non-threatening and accessible, so if we think about other forms of therapy, and I'm I'm going to use talk therapy as an example. Talk therapy is wonderful. Or talk therapy, it's amazing. This is not a diss on talk therapy. And for some individuals, talk therapy might be seen as threatening, right? I don't necessarily want to talk to somebody about my problems. I don't want to sit in a room and discuss what's happening or what I'm feeling. It just might not feel accessible to that person. 
However, presented with music, right? A therapy, a therapeutic experience presented musically, right? Let's talk about what this song makes you feel. It it takes it kind of almost puts like a little bit of a a middle middle ground, right, in that therapeutic process um, that might for certain individuals feel more accessible, um, especially when discussing history or discussing current feelings. Um, and that makes it um, attractive to some individuals. It's also, again, that interactive comp- that interactive piece there's um, often a tactile, right? We hear the music, we see the music, we feel the music. There's a tactile component with instruments. There's the vibrations of the music in and of itself. There's a sensorial component to the music, which makes it really dynamic for individuals. You know, I'm thinking specifically as I'm talking to you about preschool age um, children who might experience music therapy in a really dynamic and interactive way. Um, Another reason that music therapy works and how it works is that music activates multiple parts of the brain at once um, and can create new neural connections to increase neural neural plasticity. So neural plasticity is the idea that the brain changes. Okay. So inside your brain, there's a lot of like synapses. There's a lot of um, roads. We're going to call them roads. There's a lot of roads with cars going down, right? And neuroplasticity is the event, is is the idea that the roads are not fixed, that some of the roads might have on-ramps, some of the roads have off-ramps, some of the roads that might have gone straight, all of a sudden now they curve, right, to get us to where they're going and that the brain um, can change. And we know that that's true because we're not born and our two-year-old selves, or is not our 12-year-old self, is not our 22-year-old self, is not our... 32-year-old self is not our 82-year-old self, right? We change and our our neural capacity and our neural connections change. When we listen to music, multiple areas of the brain are activated at once. So we use one part of our brain um, to see music, the visual cortex. We use one part of our brain to f- that, that um, feels the music, that there's an emotional response to the music. It's in our limbic system. There's another um part of our brain that interprets the lyrics that are being said if there's lyrics to the piece right the speech area of our brain does that there's another part of our brain that processes the like complex visual and emotive aspects to the music the the prefrontal cortex um, of the brain so multiple areas of the brain are activated at at once. And so that can create new neural connections. And one of the um, best examples of this I can think of is if we're looking at someone with a traumatic brain injury, and you can look this up. Um, There was a whole segment on Dateline, one of the the evening news um, shows did a feature on Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. So Gabby Giffords, was shot and where she was shot she was shot in the head and where the bullet passed through affected her speech it was the speech area of her brain and so she went through you know an immense amount of rehab right and and one of the things that needed rehabilitated was her speech and so she was working with speech and language pathologists who were doing an amazing amazing job Um, And at some point during her treatment, there was a referral made for music therapy. And so the music therapist and the speech therapist were able to come together and work collaboratively in a multimodal approach to treat her, to co-treat her. And what, what they saw was that music was really able to help her make the speech connections easier. Um, So when you put put words into a song. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy. Our our brain is able to fill in the word happy easier when it's put into a song. And so they were able to use that with her. Um, and I believe she's even talked about 
when she speaks now, sometimes she uses musical notation um, in her in her speeches to help her make connections with words a little bit easier. And so that's a really, really concrete, good example of an individual who used music therapy to form new neural connections um, after experiencing a traumatic brain injury. Music can provide cues for memory and associations. We've seen this. Um, think about the last time you heard a song that you hadn't heard in a while. For me, it was the Usher concert last night. Um, and you haven't heard a song for a while and all of a sudden the music starts playing and the beat drops and you're like, I've got every single lyric to this song. I know exactly what's coming. I know how it's going to go, right? I, I, I remember the song, but not only do I remember the song, but I might remember the ex an experience that I associate with that song. Um, and so that music, that musical cue, especially for individuals with, um, for older adults, for memory and associations can be really, really helpful um, in thinking and sharing and processing um, and also provide some groundedness for individuals as well. Uh, music improvisation can incite and inhibit responses in the brain. So again, we've talked about um, how music as music um, um, activates multiple parts of the brain. Um, so it can also inhibit responses in the brain and excite um, responses in the brain. And so we've got that, that brain connection. And then music therapists use their knowledge of these principles and the elements of music to affect change, right? Music therapists have the training and the knowledge to say, okay, I know that, um, for a kiddo who has apraxia of speech, so difficulty retrieving words, right? Um, that line out singing so that you are my sunshine, my only sunshine, you make me, can help with those individuals retrieving words and forming words. Um, and so they're, they're able to use that knowledge to develop an intervention around singing that can address that goal for that client. Um, thinking about how music improvisation can excite or inhibit responses in the brain. So there's a principle within music therapy called the ISO principle. So that music, it's and it's the idea that music can meet a person um, in the mental and or physiological state that they're in. So for an, for an example, an individual that's experiencing a high degree of agitation. So you can see that they're agitated, maybe they're verbally communicating that they're agitated, and their rate of respiration is high, their, their heart rate may be high, um, those physiological things are happening. So the idea that music can meet them there in a fast tempo um, key that feels very dysregulating and very heightened. And then the improvisation of that music, so guiding that person from a heightened or dysregulated state into a more grounded, regulated state through the improvisation of the music, changing the key, changing the tempo, changing the strum pattern, the accompaniment pattern, perhaps changing the words. Can we have seen a physiological response in things that are measurable, rate of respiration, blood pressure, um, heart rate, that we can help guide an individual into a more regulated state? through improvisation. And so a music therapist is able to come in, see that, know that, pick a tempo, pick a key, pick a harmonic structure, perhaps pick words and make that decision in the moment and, and help that individual navigate um, the whatever they're experiencing in the moment. Okay, where, I think this says, Sorry, your faces are at the top of my screen. So where is music therapy practiced? So this is based on the American Music Therapy Association workforce analysis in 2021. So this is a little bit, um, it was it's three years ago, um, but I think it came out in the latter part of 2021. This is the most up-to-date knowledge that we have on where music therapy is practiced. Um, and this is based on a survey that was sent out to all music therapists. And then there's a, um, a proportion of people that respond and kind of talk about where they work. So, I mean, I will go through some of these. Um, 
things like adult day services, adult education, child and adolescent treatment centers, children's daycares or preschool for early um, childhood music, um, therapeutic music or music therapy, a children's hospital or units, community-based services, community mental health centers. So was, again, some of these can, would probably be lumped together, um, but the American Music Therapy Association has decided to keep them separate. Correctional facilities, treatment centers, substance use programs, early intervention programs, forensic facilities, hospitals, um, so like the general hospital setting, older adults facility, older adult facility, but non-nursing, so a little bit different than a nursing home or assisted living, geriatric psychiatry, group home, home health agency, end of life hospice services, intermediate care facility, inpatient psych units, military base, um, music retailer. So this is individuals that um, may practice music therapy in a setting that you would typically see people getting music lessons from. So if you think about like where you get music lessons, a lot of times it's music stores. Um, and so for some of these individuals, they may also practice music therapy um, in that type of setting. Nursing home, assisted living, neurologically impaired, um, traumatic brain injury, oncology, there's other. <laughs> so there's just other. Um, outpatient clinic, physical physical rehabilitation, private music therapy agency, private practice, uh, K through 12 schools. I'm sorry, there's are different. There's a private music therapy agency and then also a self-employed or a private practice um, area as well. State institution, support groups, university or colleges. So that's outside of the clinical training for music therapy. This would be music therapy that's provided for a university or college veterans affairs and wellness centers. So many, many, many areas, a pretty wide spectrum of where music therapy is practiced throughout the country. And again, I think you could group some of these together. You know, you could group a children's hospital or unit with a hospital, um, but there also are specific children's hospitals, right? And so I think that's why they, they want to keep it separate. But you know, there's medical music therapy, there's rehabilitative music therapy, there's community-based music therapy, there's private practice and individual music therapy. So if you kind of think through kind of those silos, um, then, then you kind of get what we have here in terms of where music therapy is practiced. And who is music therapy practiced with? So if you think about the individuals that might be associated with um where we just talked about music therapy as practice you would you would come up with this list but not exactly an um exhaustive list and again this is based on the American Music Therapy Association workforce analysis in 2021 so um abused or sexually abused individuals um, individuals living with AIDS, individuals experiencing Alzheimer's or dementia, um, individuals um, living with autism spectrum disorder, behavioral disorders, bereavement or grief. So um, a little bit different than end of life music therapy. So this is um, related. So music therapists might um, be providing services for someone who is transitioning to death. Um, but also for their family um, and their loved ones in terms of bereavement or grief. And it could just be um, bereavement or grief. There might not be a hospice component to it. Um, on cancer, individuals diagnosed with cancer, individuals diagnosed with chronic pain, individuals who are in comas, um, individuals with developmental disability, dual diagnoses, um, early childhood music therapy, so early intervention, uh, older adults, individuals diagnosed with emotional disturbances, uh, forensic music therapy, um, individuals with traumatic um, TBIs, traumatic, traumatic brain injuries, head, in, head, head injuries, um, hearing impaired individuals. This can sometimes be a contraindication for music therapy. So if an individual is... Um, you know, has a hearing impairment or a hearing disability, um, 
they could be a candidate for music therapy, but it would be something that we would look at as a music therapist because it, it might also be a contraindication for music therapy. Um, end of life care, hospice care, learning disabilities, mental health, multiply disabled, um, music education college students. This was was this one was specific. Music therapy college students. So music therapy being provided to the students in the music education and music therapy departments. Um, individuals um, living with neurological impairments, non-disabled individuals, other, got that catch-all umbrella, other, um, Parkinson's disorder, physically disabled, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, Rett syndrome, school-age population, speech um, impairments, stroke survivors, substance abuse, terminally ill, um, so that palliative care, and then um, visually impaired individuals. So those, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. If you asked a hundred music therapists, you know, who they worked with, there might be some categories that individuals would say that that are not on this list. Um, we are getting to where um, I'm gonna, you know, take take your questions if you have them. But if you're interested in music therapy on a broad scale, if you're interested in learning more about music therapy, there's a couple of thing, couple of places that you can go for more information. The first is the American Music Therapy Association. So this is the National Organization for Music Therapy. Um, they are who govern our clinical training programs. They're who run our national um, publications or journal for music therapy and our um, music therapy perspectives, which is our music therapy magazine. Um, then there is the certification board for music therapists. So this is the credentialing board. This is where all of the credentialing requirements are housed. And they're the ones that administer the um, credential of board certified music therapists. There's also a section of their website in which you can find a music therapist. You can click on their link. You can put in, you know, what you're looking for. If you're looking for a specialty, your, your um, area, the area of service, and then they will um, populate a list of who is in your area. There's also the Association for Ohio Music Therapists. So this is the statewide music therapy organization that's associated with the American Music Therapy Association. They also have um, an arm, which is kind of what I do, which is the governmental side, which is the task force. Um, but they also, I believe, have a section of their website where you can find an Ohio music, ther uh, music therapist in the state of Ohio. And then new, uh, the counseling at all, because it's a long title, Counseling Social Worker and Marriage and Family Therapist Board. Um, they're... Uh, information is there as well. This is where our scope of practice for the state of Ohio will be held. This is where our ethics rules are held, our practice rules. Um, and then my guess is, is that at some point there'll be, you know, the capability to search for licensed music therapist um, through them as well. I'm not sure how that works with social workers right now. Maybe Cassie can tell us. Um, and so that we will be housed there. Um, in the next couple of months. All right, we've got um, about 10-ish minutes before we'll wrap up and I'll give you my contact information at the end. What questions about music therapy do you have? Can I answer?